Miles Hebert with EMH and T. I also want to introduce Tom Eckergan with The Ohio State University and who was the project manager for this project. Every time I gripe about how hard my job is, I think about Tom's and I feel, realize I don't have it so bad. Um, he's been responsible for a lot of major infrastructure improvements at Ohio State over the last 10 years. So we're going to launch into this. Um, I guess I want to also say that we're privileged, we feel honored to be here. This is a prestigious hydraulics national conference. Uh, we're going to touch on hydrology and hydraulics a little bit, but really we just want to talk about the fun we've had working on this project since 2009 in some form or another, and now we're actually building something. That's always rewarding. Uh, for those of you who are from away, um, that red dot is where you are today, sitting here listening to me. Uh, the red star is the campus, the main campus, up, uh, about 10 minute drive from here. And as was mentioned just a moment ago, there's actually a field trip this afternoon. If you haven't signed up and maybe there's still some slots open, I would encourage you to do so. All right, so now we're zooming in. Uh, a couple landmarks here at Ohio State. Um, you can obviously recognize the football stadium. Uh, south of that, near King Avenue, is the medical campus, medical center. We're going to talk about that a little bit more and the need to protect it from flooding. And of course, you see the Olentangy River running right through the heart of campus. Campus is on both the east and west banks of the river. So a little bit about what got us to where we are today, some predecessor projects. Um, back in 2009, the university kicked off a framework plan, a master plan for redevelopment of the campus. Uh, one of the uh, projects that came out of that planning effort was uh, a, a north-south boulevard through campus to create better access to that medical center, medical campus, and other core areas of the campus, um, and then also recognizing the need to provide better access to and create an amenity around the Olentangy River. It's been said for years that the campus kind of turned their back on the river and weren't really um, trying to capitalize on that natural resource as an amenity. So one of the ideas that came out of that, another idea, was to remove a lowhead dam, uh, the Fifth Avenue lowhead dam, and allow for river restoration. And in fact, that occurred. Um, an ensuing project, uh, predecessor project that was completed by the um, City of Columbus with the cooperation of Ohio State. They took out the dam, did some actual physical restoration of the river channel, so now we don't have a stagnant body of water there. We actually have a, a natural flowing river. So that helps set the stage for what we're really going to drill down on today, uh, which is about flood protection of, of the university campus. So even with the restoration of the river, the Lowhead Dam removal, um, this is what is there still today, uh, was there before we got started with this project. An earthen embankment along the river adjacent to campus. Another photo of it, try and keep this one, this mental picture in your head. As we look at this picture as well from another vantage point and the river being in the background. So clearly not a levee because lots of trees and other unwanted vegetation. Uh, there's at least one breach um, in this embankment as well, so it wasn't going to be recognized by FEMA as providing uh, flood protection. So what is the issue on campus with flooding? Um, again, you can see the some landmarks there. You see the stadium, and then south is the, is the medical campus, medical center area, research facilities, um, a lot of high dollar infrastructure in there a lot of need to make sure that um, activities aren't interrupted by flooding or any other natural disaster, up to a level of the 500-year flood. And you can see that orange area denotes the area of the 500-year flood plain on campus. Um, OSU has a flood risk carrier, underwriter, insurance underwriter, and their target for OSU was to protect to at least a 500-year level of flood in order to um, have the um, the kind of robust coverage that the university wanted to protect that critical infrastructure. So I'm going to go back to our image here and just kind of walk through the project. Uh, started with phase one, uh, which you would see today being uh, built if you take the field trip, starting at King Avenue and then heading north to John Herrick Drive. That's phase one, as I said, being constructed today. Phase two will extend 
the roadway up to Woody Hayes Drive, and I'll just click that on. So there's relocated Cannon Drive with an integrated flood control measure built into it uh, to remove that 100-year and at least know that we're protected up to the 500-year level of, of flood along the Olentangy River. The road is going to continue to go a little further north, but um, we only needed to have this line of flood protection or levee uh, between the two spots, Woody Hayes and King Avenue. So what are some of the overarching project goals? Um, I mentioned this need for a transportation corridor through campus, um, getting access to core areas within, within the university, uh, provide that 500 year plus level of flood protection. At the end of the day, we want this to be a certified levy through FEMA, the National Flood Insurance Program, so we're gonna follow their rules and regulations. Um, not to be overlooked here, if any of you are familiar with the campus, and its current layout, create 12 acres of developable land, and specifically in the medical campus, um, that was a significant accomplishment as part of this project. And then adding on, building on, using the Olentangy River as an amenity, as green space. Any good um, urban infrastructure project uh, is gonna have a lot of conflicting issues, competing stakeholders who wanna see different things come out of our project. This list probably could be twice as long. Uh, we knew, of course, that we had to create or satisfy the university's uh, goals as far as creating this transportation corridor, creating a park-like setting along campus. We had a whole bunch of permits and regulatory agencies that we had to work with. And then what's, what's a good project without some utility conflicts, right? Um, and trying to overcome those. Our, our uh, Thumb in the eye was a major underground AEP transmission line that was running right through the heart of the project, so we had to work around that. All right, so getting into some of the engineering. This is, I, didn't, I don't think I said this before, but we're trying to create a boulevard. We are creating a, a boulevard through campus, so you can see an east or north and a southbound travel lanes separated by what's going to be a planted uh, median, and then we've got sidewalks, shared use paths on both sides. You know, we're, we're, it's a campus, there's gotta be lots of room for walkers, joggers, bikers, all, they all have to kind of exist, coexist in the same spot. Um, when we first started looking at this project, we thought about possibly embedding our quote unquote levy within the roadway embankment itself. We thought that'd be a nice way to have everything nice and compact. Um, but when we start talking with Ohio Department of Natural Resources who issues levy construction permits here in Ohio, they didn't like the idea of never ever being able to see this levy once it was built. So um, due to some design challenges and those regulatory issues, we, we abandoned this idea pretty early in the process. So what is a levy? And I bet you guys all know this, but just to set the stage for, for more of the conversation, that we have a clay core, we have a key trench, we've got a, a chimney drain, we've got a seepage collection system on the landward side of the levee. All of that is important to basically creating a seepage cutoff between the university campus and, and uh, the river itself, and obviously having that up in an elevation that uh, meets that higher standard for 500 plus level of flood protection. We are still embedding this levee within the landscape. So what you see here is this is a completely filled environment. The levee is subterranean, uh, so there still was a little bit of anxiety from ODNR about not being able to technically see and touch the levee, but we worked through those issues with them. Um, Any good levee has a setback for vegetation, so that was uh, something we worked pretty long and hard on. There are some FEMA, excuse me, Corps of Engineers published standards for that that I think were actually renewed, luckily, <laughs> while we were working on this project so that we could bring those to the table with DNR and, and FEMA and say, hey, we're, we're abiding by nationally accepted standards for, for vegetation setbacks. So we're gonna zoom in a little bit and talk about more of the detail of designing. This is an excerpt from the plans and I just wanted to highlight a few things um, that I think are interesting. So the big black arrow is showing you, hey, and let me, the orientation here has shifted a little bit. South is now to the left of the screen. So this is the bottom of phase one of the project. And then the right-hand side of the screen is as you move north in phase one of the project. 
and you can see that we've pushed Cannon Drive over quite a bit um, to create this boulevard effect running along or closer to the river uh, and connecting major thoroughfares. The orange shaded uh, block is part of that 12 acres of development. I don't know if anyone's tried to put a value on what 12 acres of open developable land is at Ohio State, but I bet it would be a, a big, big, big number, and this land isn't going to last long. There's, there's plans to do a lot of more development in the medical campus. Um, the red line is our line of flood protection, so our levee is offset from the roadway itself, but again, it's still embedded in a filled landscape. You can't technically see it um, once the project's completed. Uh, we do have some inspection portals um, out there for us to go look at the uh, seepage drains, for example. The uh, blue line that kind of parallels the red line is our interior drainage system that we'll talk about a little bit more. It's a big box culvert. Uh, that collects drainage from the university campus and either discharges it through a gravity system to a detention basin that you see that blue oval that then discharges directly to the river. We had to meet local stormwater management requirements for this project as, as any project that occurs here in central Ohio. Um, when the river's up and we can't get to the river through the detention basin, then a sluice gate comes down and uh, water would flow directly into the pump station, which is that blue shaded area uh, north of the orange block. And then it's pumped out to the river via that pump stormwater pump station. So we have to have the ability, for those of you who have been around levees, to be able to evacuate stormwater from the campus um, even when the levee's up and that we have no gravity drain. Just a little bit more of uh, phase one of the project and point out a fun fact here. I didn't highlight it, but um, we have a AEP substation out here. A lot of utilities going out from and into that pump st or that uh, substation. <clears throat> so we were trying to snake our levee along the road next to this very big um, substation. And there was just no way we were going to be able to put that clay core without just running into all kinds of different utilities. And these would be now penetrations through our, our line of flood protection. Luckily, um, that ground was already high enough. And with our geotechnical engineer assisting us, we came up with a jet grout system to create that seepage line, that seepage barrier, without actually having to excavate and, and build something down there. We're basically working around the utilities in place. All right, so a little bit of hydrology and hydraulics here. Um, things that we did to feel comfortable about achieving the goal. And I was in an earlier session and listening to, um, uh, there was a question asked about designing for risks and ever increasing risks given climate change. Um, so we were very conscious of, conscientious of of realizing what we are, our goals were and, and felt like we had to be very, very careful in our analysis. The Olentangy River, 543 square miles. Uh, we had a great FEMA model to start with. Uh, because of that restoration project I mentioned before, there had been a FEMA model update, so we had a great HECRAS model to work with, and we've since updated that. Um, I didn't note it on here, but the Delaware Dam controls about a half to a third of the entire watershed, so that had an influence on our, our hydrology, what we calculated. Um, the old hydrology was based on uh, basically a log Pearson uh, statistical analysis of, of gauge records over 80 or 90 years, so pretty good stuff, but we still developed a swim model. Um, we were asked to do, develop a swim model to actually do a level pool routing through that Delaware Dam and feel really good about what it's doing to buffer flood flows as they get closer and closer to the university campus. Then I mentioned our higher standard. We're actually designing to 500 year plus two feet with, uh, with our flood protection. So this is a whole nother session um, about interior drainage analysis or designing your interior drainage system based on a joint probability analysis. Um, the, I'll, I'll say the ironic thing is this isn't really a modeling exercise. You're looking at a lot of historical rainfall data, flood data. Then I think there's a little bit of black magic in there. 
and they figure out what is the probability of flooding happening in the river at the same time you're getting a large storm event local to the university campus. So you're trying to figure out how big does that pump station have to be? Well, the, the, the good news was that there, we found there was not a, a strong correlation. So our, we were designing for a 500 year level of flood protection. And so our joint probability of occurrence on that right hand column is always 500 year. But if we're looking at a river event in a uh, flood event in the river, that's a 1% event. If you're looking at the first row, then we're designing our interior drainage system for the 500 year. You flip it and you've got a 500 year flood in the river, your interior drainage system needs to be designed for a one year event. That's a big win for us as far as uh, sizing a, a stormwater pump station. The event that actually controlled the capacity was I've got this, the, uh, the red X next to it is that 500, excuse me, 50 year flood river, 10 year local. So our pump station is designed to evacuate the 10 year local event. Again, a much bigger, much bigger conversation. Oh boy. Well, I said we were having problems and this is one of them. There's a graphic missing here. So use your imagination. But um, what, what this was supposed to show you, <laughs> sorry, is a very complicated network of storm pipes interior to the university campus. This was our swim model where we were looking at, again, that joint probability, bringing flow to our stormwater pump station, integrated the pump obviously into the model to make sure that it was capable of evacuating flood events. Uh, props to the USGS if they're here in the room. They helped us install a gauge um, along the Olentangy River right at campus so, and with telemetry. So we are, know when the river reaches a certain stage when to start controlling that salute, that gate at our pump station that allows more flow to go there and get evacuated to the river. So that was critical. Sorry about the graphic. And this doesn't look any better except on the right, you can see that this is an architectural rending, rendering of our stormwater pump station. It is a building. This is a, a feature now on campus, not just a little room that you walk in and, and pull some switches and levers. This is a building, um, much to the chagrin of some at Ohio State. But uh, we worked through that with them architecturally, and, and hopefully they'll be happy with it when it's done. Um, one of the things that we had to work out is we need a secondary source of power to a pump station. Of course, if you're having a natural disaster, you might lose your primary source of power. This thing still needs to work. Um, they didn't want to have a big diesel generator on site with a big gas reserve tank, so they, uh, we figured out how to hook up to a natural gas line that was running by campus, and we have a natural gas-powered generator as, as backup. So a little cleaner, a little bit more compact in terms of the, the final design. That was a big win for us. Permits, permits, permits. Um, the big one for us to get this job off the ground was working with ODNR. They administer construction permits for dams and levees in the state. I'll tell you, we spent a lot of time with them early and then often during the course of the project to make sure that as we made decisions, we weren't starting to maybe veer from what their expectations were. Um, they were very good to work with, and I'm not just saying that. They were very helpful to us, guiding us, and um, cooperative in terms of meeting our schedule for the project. Um, the requirement is to submit a preliminary design report. We had to do that for the entire project. They wanted to see the full build out of the levy, of course, to understand how we were going to achieve our larger goal. But then they gave us a permit for just phase one. Uh, so we could get started on the project. So we gave them a final design report for that, and we got that back um, in the fall of last year. FEMA, um, we did pursue, obtained a, a conditional letter of map revision, um, partly because there was a small, small rise in our flood elevation due to our encroachment with the levee. But more importantly, the Clomar was giving us 
the university and everyone else who was a stakeholder on the project that we were meeting all the requirements of NFIP 6512 that pretty much sets out your design criteria for a levy. Um, freeboard, for those of you who don't know, is three to four feet of freeboard. Well, boy, we blew that out of the water because of this higher design standard that was being applied to the project. But of course, there are all these other things that we had to check, check, check. And we submitted that all to FEMA as part of a conditional letter map revision. And the question was, if we build this project just like this, are you going to remove your flood hazard designation behind the levy? The answer was yes. So that was obviously the reassurance that we needed that we were heading down the right path. So here we are um, today under construction, um, expecting to be completed with, with phase one by the end of next year. Um, so it's a big project. Um, and you get to see it this afternoon if you're one of the lucky ones. Phase two, we've kind of wrapped up schematic design phase of the project, provided a cost estimate that so far OSU can live with <laughs> that says this is what it's going to take to build it. We're moving on to final design with, we say construction TBD, we don't want to jinx it or anything, but um, we might be under construction um, late 2020 and then wrapping up the following year or 2022. That's the goal because what we want to do is go back to FEMA and get those maps changed, go back to the flood risk underwriter and say, hey, we did it, and, make, and get, the, get adjustment there. So um, we're, we're, we're getting really close to that. We've got, we've got our eye on the ball there. Um, takes a village. So the MH and T's up here talking about this project today, but there were a lot of folks who were involved. Um, MKSK landscape architect, everything had to look good. It couldn't just work well, it had to look nice. So we, we got a lot of input from them, a lot of MEP folks here, power, me, uh, mechanical design, uh, two geotechnical engineers, you know, why just one? So we had a lot of help from, from them and getting information that we needed to understand how to protect ourselves from the river. Uh, this was a, a roadway job too, so Trans Associates was certainly helping with that, and the City of Columbus was a partner with um, with Ohio State at least for Phase One of the project. So everyone pitched in hard on this, and we got to where we are today. And I know this is my last slide. And Tom is here to answer any help me answer any questions. I was just wondering. You said you The, right. Um, it does not. That was discussed. Uh, part of that partnership between Columbus and Ohio State at the time was that they were actually going to be responsible for it, maintaining it. So that kind of changed any extracurricular programming that we can put in it. Um, I didn't mention this before, but there's a second phase of this project. There's going to be another pump station. You know, my joke is buy, buy one, get the second one half off. And that's going to be maybe more under OSU's control to put something in there that's programming. That's it. <laughs>